or, or, or give relevance to the visual, uh, to the iconic messages uh, without the text, without the need of the words, of the verbal thoughts. And, and this is in the, also related to the gestalt theory and uh, also Rudolf Arnheim. So, okay. So in 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 this book, uh, Rhetoric of the Image, Roland Barthes talks about um, the linguistic message of this image and the symbolic message and the literal message. So he he uh, studies the text of this image and uh, we will see. So in that text, um, he sees a denoted message and a connoted message. Um, the denoted message is the captions and the labels on the produce, and the connoted message is the word Manzani. So it connotes Italianism. So this is the linguistic message. See, if we go to the image, we see some, you know, the caption and, and some words. And that would be the linguistic message that he studies in the image. One is denoted and the other one is connoted. And then he sees another level, the symbolic message, is the connoted image. And he sees four signs which are non-linguistic. Um, and he talks about the half open bag, it has a meaning, signifies return from market. Tomatoes and pepper signify Italianicity, and the collection of objects signifies a total culinary service. So this is part of the symbolic message, connotations of the images that we see. And then there is the literal message, which is the denotative message. On that level is non-coded. The image of the tomato represents a tomato, uh, tomato. the image of the pepper represents a pepper, and so on. So, he remarks that in this case we have a signifier and a signifier which are essentially the same. This is a message without a code at this level. So, Roland Barthes did this in the 60s with this image. So I think this is it's a valid analysis, basic analysis for some visual poems and other types of experimental poems. I am not saying that this image is a visual poem or an experimental poem, but we may take, we may approach a visual poem um, by using this um, type of visual semiotics and, and analysis, analyzing the texts and the symbolic messages of the text and connotations and denotations. Um, so I think this is still valid for certain experimental poems. Um, okay. Then we have another key figure in semiotics, which is Hubert Eco. I think, um, for instance, the concept of open texts it's very valid as well. Texts that are the most active between mind and society and life are open texts. So Echo emphasizes that words do not have meanings in themselves. Words are simply lexical and operate in the context of utterance. So uh, they emphasize the openness, the, the dynamic that exists between the readers uh, and, and, and the texts themselves. So there is no fixed meaning. Uh, if there is a fixed meaning, uh, well, it would be a different type of text, and he calls it a closed text, which leads the reader to one intended interpretation only. Um, so, okay. Then there are other figures who approach, um, you know, in post-structuralism, like Julia, Julia Cristeva, she kind of follows uh, the psychoanalysis, the symbolic post Lacan. Um, she sees different levels, but also she ends up saying that even after entering the symbolic, the subject continues to oscillate between the semiotic and the symbolic, therefore, rather than arriving at a fixed identity, the subject is permanently in process. So, if we apply this to a textual, uh, to an, an, a textual analysis, we will see that we will end up uh, in a continuous, um, ongoing process of, of, of giving meanings to, 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 to the identities of the texts, to the meanings of the texts, 
So this is part of the post-structuralist um, notion of, of, of meaning. There is nothing fixed. Signs in themselves do not mean uh, something fixed, but uh, it depends on um, it's something dynamic. Okay. Then we have also the read up uh, and uh, the construction. And um, he goes beyond the, the binary of oppositions, and, and um, he is also talking about the, the flux, the, the continuous flux of, of, of uh, meaning, uh, the text, the construction itself, when, when one interprets it. So there is no fixed um, meaning at all. So this is also another valid approach when, when talking or, or analyzing experimental poems. Um, okay. I think a, a, another approach that I find um, very interesting uh, is uh, the studies of Rudolf Arnheim. He talked in the 60s as well about visual thinking. Um, he, he thought that all thinking is perceptual in nature. Uh, and then he used the gestalt psychology uh, in art. Um, and and the, the, best, the gestalt theory thinks that the whole is made up of an interrelationship of its parts, and no, no sum of the parts equals the whole. Um, so, I am interested in the, in the idea of visual thinking, especially in poems that go beyond the text, because uh, usually um, in academia and in, 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 in structuralism, uh, they think that uh, they always study the linguistic patterns, the verbal thought. They, it's very difficult to include other types of thinking. Um, so to me, Rudolf Warhol is, is, is kind of an open uh, window um, for us to, to, to use. He's giving us some, some tools uh, and food for thought when uh, analyzing experimental poems. Um, okay. Then another approach that I think is also interesting is uh, on the media and materiality, the materiality of the signs and the medium, and uh, the role of the media today in experimental poetry is very important. Isn't it? It's not just the, the white page. Uh, we have different media and they have their own role. Um, McLuhan was a um, controversial figure in, in, in a sense because one of the, the his thoughts was that um, the media um, are extensions of, of men, in a way. Um, and some scholars have around said that uh, that is not exactly true. But all the other ideas of McLuhan, I think they are very valid as well. Like when he says that um, communication technology and by this, we can understand alphabetic writing, the printing press, electronic media. All these type of technologies uh, affect cognitive organization, um, which in turn affects social organization. So he said that if a new technology extends one or more of our senses outside us into the social world, then new radios among all of our senses will occur in that particular culture. It is comparable to what happens when a new note is added to a melody. And when the sense ratios alter in any culture, then what had appeared lucid before may suddenly become opaque, and what had been vague or opaque will become translucent. So he was very aware of, of how a new medium can affect our way of thinking. And I think that's very valid. Uh, when approaching or analyzing an experimental type of poem. Um, okay. uh, later on, uh, Friedrich Kittler, a literary scholar and a, a theorist, um, talks about the autonomy in technology. And he says that media determine our situation. And in a way, he disagrees with McLuhan's reading of the media as extensions of man. Um, I think both, both, both ideas are, are um, interesting and valid uh, in a way. Um, okay. 
Then we have another uh, figure. He was a, 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 an artist and a critic. And uh, in the 60s as well, he, was, he coined the concept of intermedia poetry. And uh, he, he said that uh, probably the best, the best forms of art tend to fall in between media. And uh, he, in a way, he was against uh, categorizing uh, artistic expressions. He was more in favor of, of uh, seeing art as a holistic expression. But he was aware of, of, of different styles in art. Um, so he, this is uh, what he wrote. Much, much of the best work being produced today seems to fall between media. This is no accident. The concept of the separation between media arose in the Renaissance. The idea that a painting is made of paint on canvas or that a sculpture shouldn't be painted seems characteristic of the kind of social thought which we call the feudal conception of the great chain of being. This essentially mechanistic approach continued to be relevant throughout the first two industrial revolutions just concluded and into the present era of automation, which constitutes in fact a third industrial revolution. However, the social problems that characterize our time, as opposed